Good morning, everyone. How's it going so far? I'm going to apologize multiple times throughout this for my voice. I'm so sorry. I'm losing my voice since last night. So bear with me. Hey, Nicole, since you happen to be our Monday morning uh, um, reader for Pastor Sean, would you be able to help me out this morning as well, please? And thank you. Thanks. Good morning. All right. So many happy faces to start the day. Just jumping in. Let me try something really quick. Hold on. If I have my Let me try this. All right, sorry, I was trying a couple things with my microphone. Not working. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, Fusion family. Happy Monday. It's October 30th, rounding out the month of October. We're going into First Chronicles 15 this morning. So... I'm going to apologize ahead of time for my voice. I'm so sorry. After all the fun yesterday, a friends and family weekend, I've been losing my voice. So um, I'm going to make this as short and sweet as possible to spare you all hearing this for too much longer. <laughs> um, let's start off. We'll pray in and the amazing Nicole Benowitz will help through reading uh, First Chronicles 15 with us. All right. So. Take a deep breath. We'll focus ourselves and we'll begin. All right, God. Thank you so much, Lord, for another day we get to come into your presence. Thank you, God, for another morning, Lord, of your mercy, of your grace, of your love. Thank you that we get to press into your word this morning. All the beautiful lessons and the truth and the grace you have to share with us through it. Right now, Lord God, I would decrease and you would increase. God, let be your word, your truth your wisdom that's shared with your people, not my own. God, just give us your wisdom, 
for we need you for today. Open our eyes, ears, hearts, and minds to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So, Nicole, take it away. You had to lose your voice on the day when there's 20,000 names in there for me to pronounce, right? Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm reading out of the uh, NIV version. Uh, we, again, we are in First Chronicles 15. Uh, starting with verse 1. After David had constructed buildings for himself in the city of David, he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, no one but the Levites must may carry the ark of God because the Lord chose them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister before him forever. David assembled all Israel in Jerusalem <clears throat> to bring up the ark of the Lord to the place he had prepared for it. He called together the descendants of Aaron and the Levites from the descendants of Kohath, Uriel the leader, and 120 relatives from the descendants of Merari, Asiah the leaders, and 220 relatives. From the descendants of Gershon, Joel the leader, and 130 relatives. From the descendants of Elazaphan, Shemaiah the leader, and 200 relatives. From the descendants of Hebron, Eliel the leader, and 80 relatives. From the descendants of Uziel, Aminadab the leader, and 112 relatives. Then David summoned Zadok and Abiathar the priests, and Uriel, Asiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Aminadab. Uh, the Levites. He said to them, you are the heads of the Levitical families. You and your fellow Levites are to consecrate yourselves and bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I have prepared for it. It was because of you, the Levites. It was because of you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him and how to do it in the prescribed way. So the priests and Levites consecrated themselves in order to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of the God with the poles on their shoulders as Moses had commanded in accordance with the word of the Lord. Uh, verse 16, David told the leaders of Levites to appoint their fellow Levites as musicians to make a joyful sound with musical instruments, lyres, harps, and cymbals. So the Levites appointed Haman, son of Joel, from his relatives, Asaph, son of Berechiah, and from their relatives, the Merorites. Ethan, son of Cushiah, and with them, their relatives next in rank, Zechariah, Jaziel, Jemarama, Jehiel, Unai, uh, Eliah, Eliab, Beniah, Messiah, Mattathiah, Eliphelu, Mechaniah, Ebed, Ebed Edom, and Jael, the gatekeepers. The musicians, Heman, Asaph, and Ethan, were to sound bronze cymbals. Zechariah, Jaziel, Shemaramath, Jehiel, Unai, Eliab, Messiah, and Benaiah were to play the lyres according to Alamoth. And Mattathiah, Eliphalehu, Mechaniah, Oben, Edom, Jehiel, and Azaziah were to play the harps directing according to Shamanith. Kananiah, the head Levite, was in charge of the singing, and that was his responsibility because he was skillful at it. Berechiah and Elkanah were to be doorkeepers for the ark. Shebaniah, Joshaphat, Nathaniel, Amasai, Zechariah, Benani, and Eliezer. The, the priests were to blow trumpets before the ark of God. Obed, Edom, and Jehiah were also to be doorkeepers for the ark. So David and the elders of Israel and the commanders of units of a thousand went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed, Edom with rejoicing. Because God had helped the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the, of the Lord, seven bulls and seven rams were sacrificed. Now David was clothed in a robe of fine linen, as were all the Levites who were carrying the Ark, and as were the musicians and Kenaniah, who was in charge of singing of the choirs. David also wore a linen ephod. So all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouts, with the sounding of rams, horns, and trumpets, and of cymbals, and the playing of lyres and harps. As the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window, and when she saw King David dancing and celebrating, she despised him in her heart. Word of the Lord. Hey, man. Thank you so much, Nicole. You crushed all those names. See? Yeah, my That's best. Good work. <laughs> Answer prayers. All right, so <clears throat> a lot to press into. <clears throat> sorry now i have a voice to share it with <laughs> um all right so 
<clears throat> previously on soap from last week, if you remember, we started off in chapters, um, chapter 10, first chronicles, right? The first, um, first nine chronicles, first nine chapters were all the genealogy of the families of Israel. And then these early years are actually recounting King David's reign, which is actually kind of a reflection of second Samuel, which we uh, went through about a few weeks ago, right? But First Chronicles gives more of a details, more of a historical accounts of King David's reign, right? So it's really cool. We can look at both the Second Samuel chapter and this chapter in Chronicles together to get a full picture of the same story, right? So this um, chapter right here is also in <clears throat> Second Samuel chapter six, when David the second attempt, second test of David bringing the ark back to Jerusalem, right? So first one, first one and two, um, he's preparing to bring it back, right? And he says, no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God because the ark chose them to carry the ark because the Lord chose them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister before him forever. This is a change of heart, right? He realized his mistakes from the first time. He tried carrying it himself, right? He tried carrying it with <coughs> um, other men, he had chosen, but praise God for second chances, right? We all have those things we think we're doing right. We think we know what we're doing um, to honor God, quote unquote, honor God. And sometimes it doesn't always go the way we want it to, right? He's the God of second chances. And so we're seeing here how David is learning his lesson from chapter 13 of First Chronicles. Like I said, also from Second Samuel 6. He's learning his lessons. So verse 3 What's he doing? He's calling together the descendants of Aaron and the Levites from the descendants of Kohath and going through, you know, the whole list of the leaders of the tribes of from his family. Altogether, it's 867 total descendants. He's calling together to worship and travel alongside the ark. That's basically our entire Sunday services, you know, for give or take a few you know, hundred. But it's basically imagine an entire Sunday morning of church services across five, you know, five services across both locations, you know, in person coming together to have a giant worship party, a giant caravan to carry God's presence with them. Right. And it's really cool again, because um, we're seeing how this list of names is actually giving validity to this whole project, right? Validity to this whole um, mission that David's on these like I said these were all men and leaders and relatives of the Levites so we're seeing that there's more authority and there's more blessing from God because David's following what was actually prescribed to him, to the Ark of the Covenant those who were called to minister to the Ark of the Covenant right if God calls us to something we need to own it right it's our role our responsibility to own what God's giving us to steward and to end our ministry, right? Whether it's ministry in the church, in our home, in a workplace, whatever it looks like, your ministry is your ministry. And God's going to call you to it no matter what anyone else tries to say or think or even how you think of it sometimes, right? So walk in that confidence, walk in that authority that God's called you in, right? That's what we're seeing David do here through the Levites and through these, these family lines. Um, verse 15, or verse, I'm sorry, 11 through 15, talking about how David is summoning the people and what the preparations are, right? To consecrate themselves, to bring the Lord up. It's because of, in verse 13, he says, it's because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time. The Lord, our God, broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him of how to do it in the prescribed way. So what was that prescribed way? Exodus 25, it tells us. In verse 10, he says, God tells them, have them make an ark of Acadia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, a cubit and a half high. So basically it's about three, three and three quarter feet, so just under four feet long, and just over two feet wide and high. Overlay with pure gold, both inside and out. Make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it 
and fastened them to its four feet, with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of Acadia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry it. Poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. So basically, it's a giant chest, right? If you have a giant um, a chest or not like a suitcase, but not, not, a, not a good example, right? All traditional suitcase, right? Like a nice, you know, like Oregon Trail or nice, you know, Revolutionary War style with a nice wooden case, right? On these two long poles. And so we're talking, we're talking, it's wood, so it's heavy. Even if it's only four by two, it's still heavy box. The gold makes it heavy. <laughs> the poles with the, the gold makes it, even the poles themselves are heavy, right? And so that's what they're being told to carry on their shoulders. And yet, in 2 Samuel 6 and 1 Chronicles 13, you read about the Israels trying to move it, the ark, with it on a cart pulled by oxen. And that's what led to almost falling over and where Uzzah was killed for touching it, trying to catch it from falling over, right? And what's, what's happening? You know, God told us how, them, how to do something. He told the Israelites how to prepare to move his presence. And they tried doing, taking the easy way out, right? They thought they could be so cool, so fancy with this new cart, this new technology, right? That the Philistines actually had. So when the Philistines stole the ark, they put it on a cart and carried it off. And so it's much easier when you have ox on a cart to pull this big, heavy box, right? But the reality is, there's no easy way to, to carry out what God's called you to carry out, both physically, right, like, a, like an ark, and, and spiritually, and emotionally, mentally, in your leadership, whatever it looks like. There's no easy way to carry what God's called you to carry. And that's supposed to be easy. If it was easy, someone else could do it, not you, right? And so God gives them a very clear description of how to carry this out, which they failed at the first time. And so when David comes back the second time here, in chapter six, uh, chapter 15, excuse me, in chapter 15, he's giving them a, a change of heart, right? He's saying, hey, guys, let's do it right this time, right? And he even says in Numbers 4, verse 15, um, after Aaron and his sons have finished covering the, covering the holy furnishings and all the holy articles, when the camp is ready to move, only then are the Kolahites to come and do the carrying, but they must not touch the holy things or they will die. And that's why we had the Ark on the Covenant on the poles. Because the, the Ark is so holy, you can't touch it. That's why when Uzzah touched the cart, even though, you know, he may have been trying to help, just the, that unholy act, that the act of an instinct, of, of not thinking something through, right? He lost his life. And the same thing here, you know, with this Ark. The point is they're on the poles, so you don't touch the Ark. <clears throat> and they're also being called to consecrate themselves. In Exodus 19 and Leviticus 16 and 21, we read some of the um, consecration methods that they use for the priests, through sacrifices, through fasting, through avoiding unclean contact, preparation to, the, to do their holy work. And <clears throat> I'm reading these details, right? It's, I'm not going to go into all the details today. But if you want to, I guess Exodus 19, Levit Leviticus 16 and 21, you can look at yourselves and see the consecration methods. Now, all I think is, thank God for Jesus, right? Because of Jesus' sacrifice, we no longer have to consecrate ourselves to serve his presence. We no longer have to, you know, if you're serving on a dream team on Sunday morning, or you're serving at youth on Monday night, or you're serving as a connect group leader during the week, you know, because of Jesus, we no longer have to go through a whole consecration process and, and go through legalism to serve God's house. Amen. And that's not to say we shouldn't be reverent. That's not to say we shouldn't, you know, take these things for granted, right? And take our leadership or our serving, you know, for granted or with, with haphazard actions, you know? You still need to have reverence. still need to have honor and respect for God's house. We need to have... um a personal, you know, self-reflection and personal self-examination in our, our own, you know, walk with God. But yeah, because of Jesus' sacrifice, 
We won't have to go through this whole consecration process, right? We're all called to be chosen, a chosen people, a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood. And because of Jesus' sacrifice, we get to walk in that royal priesthood calling. Amen. <clears throat> and the reality is, it's not just the what or the why, but the how we serve God that matters. You know, like I said, you know, we can serve God with all the, the newest ways, you know. But the Israelites thought they were so cool to serve God as brand new with technology, right? We can think we're so cool, you know, posting about God on social media or, you know, trying to do whatever we want to do. And, oh, look, this new technology. And we think to bless, to bless God and to, to praise God and do all these things. But the reality is if our heart's in the wrong place, if we're trying to take the easy way out of something, if we're trying to build our own platform, not our, not God's platform, the reality is it's not going to be blessed. And we can't do things the easy way or, or the selfish way or our way because obedience to God's word brings blessing. Obedience to God's calling, God's purposes, God's plans for us is where the blessing is. And we read that back in 1 Chronicles 13, right? And even, like I said, 2 Samuel 6, too. Um, after the incident with the ark, after Uzzah was killed, David didn't want the ark anymore. He was he was fearful of it. So he sent it to live in, at the home of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. <laughs> and during its stay in Obed-Edom's home, his home was blessed for three months because the presence of God was there. Because he was obedient to it. There was blessing in his home. There's blessing for us in our homes, for our families. We walk in obedience to God. Amen. And so, so thank God for second chances, right? Because we're seeing that in this, this story of David. How he learned his lesson. He failed the test the first time. But because of God's grace and mercy and love for us, he let David and he lets us retake the test to deepen our walk and our faith in him. So our first application question today, if you're taking notes, is there any test or lesson God is giving you a second chance on today? How can you, like David, inquire of him, inquire of God about how to do it in the prescribed way so you can go closer to him and pass the test? Skipping down to verse 16 through 24, all these amazing names that Nicole read to us, of the band, right? These are all the Levites, the musicians, making a joyful sound, going through and praising God on lyres, on harps, on cymbals. They're singing, they're shouting God's praises, right? I think what's so cool in this moment to remember is that David was also a musician. David was a songwriter. Remember all the Psalms? You know, we, we've read about David. He was, a, he was a musician in Saul's house before he was even king, right? His first foot in the door of the of the, the kingdom, of the palace, was as a musician. And yet, even though he was a musician, he didn't make this whole moment about him, right? We see he was a musician, but he had, he had all these other musicians he partnered alongside with, right? Because a good leader delegates and empowers others to serve God together with him. He didn't make his own way. He didn't try and be a one-man show, one-man band, right? Even says that Kenaniah, the head Levite, was in charge of the singing. That was his responsibility because he was skillful at it. <laughs> whether you're leading in the church, whether you're leading in your family, whether you're leading in your workplace, whether you're, you know, whoever God's called you to steward or whoever he's called you to steward, we're here to empower other people, just like David did here. He didn't try and do it all himself, right? So find those people you can come together alongside to serve God, to come together with, to make a joyful sound, announcing his presence, right? Because that's why we worship the way we do on a Sunday morning, you know? You ever notice the three songs we play sing on Sunday morning? That first song on the production, on the production team, we joke it. We joke, we call, uh, we hear a good song. Oh, that's, that's a song one. Oh, that's a high energy song. Oh, that song's all about praising God. It's got a great rhythm, a great beat. You can dance to it. Oh, that's, that's a song one, you know? That first song every Sunday morning is to announce God's presence with joyful sound and to enter into his presence, right? And again, it's coming together with other believers 
not by ourselves, you know, because we can sing up by ourselves in our car. I do. And you luck I only sing by myself in my car. All right. Not on the, on the platform. Right. We, we all can, you know, play an instrument. We all can beat our little desk, you know, desk drum. You can't play a real instrument, you know, air guitar, you know, find an instrument you can play. Right. Um, sing where, where you can sing in the shower, wherever it is, you know, and it's great to do it by ourselves. We come together as as Christ followers to come together for that joyful sound. It's been more powerful, amen. It's been more pleasing to our God, to our Father, who we love, right? To our Savior. So, our second application question: Who are you gathering around you? Who are you empowering to worship alongside you? Is it your family, your family members? Is it your kids? Is it your coworkers? Is it your fellow students if you're in school? Is it your fellow connect group members or, or dream teamers you serve with and come together with during the week? Who can you be an example for today and how you worship him? Who can you make a joyful sound with today? All right, moving down. Verse 25 to 28. We hear David and the elders, the commanders of units of thousands, went to bring the ark to the covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with rejoicing. And so they're going down from the house to Jerusalem. Um, it's about 12, my research found it's about 12 to 15 kilometers. It's about 7.5 to 9 miles of this walk, right? So they didn't walk around the corner, you know? They didn't walk down the street. They walked. Again, and, and you're, they're carrying a heavy box of wood on heavy poles for up to 9 miles. That's honor. That's commitment. That's walking literally in your calling, right? And what's so powerful here is in verse 26. I love it how it says, because God had helped the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, seven bulls and seven rams were sacrificed. So they're doing, they're sacrificing, right? And why are they sacrificing? Because God had helped the Levites. To, oh. Not just physically, God's helping them, but also in the mental and the emotional and the spiritual weight of what they're carrying. God was there to lift them up and to give them the strength they needed. So when we carry a task or a mission or ministry or a purpose that God has given us, how he extracts us to carry it, he will help us. Whether that's leading a connect group or leading on the dream team, whether that's serving in a way outside of our comfort zone on the weekends or during the week. Whether it's not, it's not just inside the walls of our church, but in the workplace, as a parent, as we live out this Christian walk for others to see, when we carry that weight that God's given us to carry with vision, with obedience, he will help us to carry it, you know? And so cool, again, we're seeing how the same record from 2 Samuel 6 is here in 1 Chronicles 15. But this time, it's from the perspective of seeing all of Israel being emphasized, right? Second Samuel 6 is about David's reign, David's actions, David's life, more or less. We're seeing more of David's perspectives. But here, First Chronicles 15, we're seeing how all of Israel is coming together and emphasizing how they are all supporting this, this mission, right? This work David's called them to do. And we're seeing it's so cool again. It's not a one-man show. And whatever God's called you to, you know, it's not a one-man show. You need people to come alongside you to support that vision, support that ministry, support that that purpose in God's in God's part in your, in your heart, right? And so we're seeing how, you know, it's, when we, it's our personal vision, our personal expression of faith like David had. And yet all of Israel, you know, all your dream team, your fellow dream teamers, all your connect group members, you know, all of your, your leaders, all of your coworkers, all of your, your Christian brothers and sisters can come alongside you, to support you in making it happen, right? And that's one of the things we see today, even here at Fusion, you know, Pastor Brendan um, is well known to brag about, you know, our dream teamers and brag about, you know, our freedom conference, how, you know, he's, he's not there for a Sunday, either he's speaking somewhere else. Or if he's at a different location, if he's at Cumberland on a Sunday, you know, or out, shout out to Cumberland County, right? He's at, he's at EHT preaching. So Cumberland County gets it done, 
you know, with Pastor Jason there, or even the Freedom Conference, you know, there was one Freedom Conference where um, he wasn't there the whole day because he had, I think Daniel had a hockey game or something, or something happened where he couldn't be there for the majority of the conference. And so he was there, you know, he showed up in the afternoon for the conference. And even when Pastor Brendan not there, but without the lead pastor, God was still moving, you know, the lead pastor doesn't have to be somewhere for God to work through his people. Right. You know, and like I said, he, and the body of Christ comes together to be the body of Christ. You know, our freedom, we have almost a hundred volunteers, every freedom conference, the last few freedom conferences. Right. And so it's not about one person or one speaker or one leader or even one pastor. Right. Because when the body of Christ comes together, fulfill a vision fulfill a, a purpose that god's given them god's going to show up god's going to move right we're going to see that his power his healing exemplified same thing on a sunday you know whether you know back in the summer's point days and the maze landing days even now at cumberland county right we have you know we do video messages we live stream places you know people watch online our online family you know we see god move in incredible ways we're not making this up, you know, through our online family. We see God move. <coughs> we see God move in to bring salvation online through a computer screen, to bring salvations through a, a live stream to another location. We see God move through people getting receiving prayer online, you know? So we don't have to be seeing a physical person, a physical leader. See the body of Christ work, right? And it's so powerful because we need every person to come together to be the part of this body, right? It's not about one person. It's not about just David. It's all the Israelites, all the musicians, all the Levites coming together to see God's, God's, you know, blessing over his people and see life change happen in the nation of Israel. So application question. How does God want you to help today to what he has asked you to, oh sorry <clears throat> let me try this again has god wanted to help you today to what he has called you to carry or fulfill out how can we continue to rejoice in the midst of that calling again they're walking seven and a half to nine miles you know and yet they're rejoicing as they're carrying this heavy wood on this long journey they're rejoicing in god's presence how can we do the same in the midst of our own calling Wrapping up here, verse 29. As the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. When she saw King David dancing and celebrating. She despised him in her, in her heart. And we see um, in, in 2 Samuel 6, a little more detail from, Sam, from um, David's perspective on this moment, right? But the reality is, whether you're David, whether you're us today, you're going to face haters. You're going to face people that despise you because of what you believe and how you live out your life. The first Corinthians 118 reminds us that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. Verse 25, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. <clears throat> So remember what someone thinks about you. <clears throat> Walk with confidence that God sees you and will honor you for honoring him. We serve a God who is faithful to his faithful. So be faithful. You know, just like um, how Michael despised David personally, my own reflections in this. I believe part of that, 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 that despising came from the realization that he would never worship her, but he worshiped God. Because the way we, the, the world was just to worship the world, you know, that, that boss, maybe even that spouse, you know, that child, if we worship something or someone that's not God, it's going to cause a, a distance between us and God, right? But David didn't want that. David wanted all of God. <clears throat> So he worshiped God with all he had. <coughs> so 
when Michael, when Michael realized that she, he would never worship her, but he worshiped God, she despised him, right? Because if she got, because she was Saul's daughter, remember? And there's such a things as generational curses, as family sin patterns. <clears throat> so we're seeing that sin pattern from Saul, who want all the attention, who want people to only look at him, who, you know, who's full of selfishness and vanity, and more concerned with what other people would say about him rather than what God thought about him, right? That sin pattern is what we're seeing played out here in Michael's own perspective, in Michael's life. And that's in 2 Samuel 6, it even goes on to say that Michael had no children to the day of her death because of this moment. A mother, a mother that was God and his, you know, his lack of blessing over her, her family, or whether that was David, you know, no longer wanting to have relations with her because of how, how much... You know, she despised him and he he wasn't going to have that connection with her anymore, right? Either way, that family sin pattern, not putting God first from Saul, it ended with Michael, right? Because she had no children to pass that, that, that generational curse onto, you know? And so sometimes we need to be really aware of ourselves and things we're saying and doing to others and how that has the potential to pass on to our kids or to those around us. <clears throat> even if it's not blood relatives, but our nieces or nephews or, or family members, kids, or friends' kids, right? Being aware of what we pass on to our kids or we don't pass on to our kids is so crucial, amen? <clears throat> so we always need to put God first. We need to worship him first and be the example for others and our families in our, our workplaces, our schools, whatever it is, see us living by example first and how we worship and how we serve. Amen. So get your notebooks ready. Our three application questions as we close out. Number one, is there any test or lesson God is giving you a second chance on today? <clears throat> how can you inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way David did. <clears throat> so you can grow so that you can grow closer to God and pass the test. <coughs> Question two: Who are you gathering around you or empowering you to worship God alongside? Family members, your kids, your co-workers, your fellow students, your connect group members, your dream teamers. Who can you be an example for today and how you worship him? Application question number three. How does God want to help you today with what he has called you to carry or fulfill? How can we continue to rejoice in the midst of that calling? Let's pray. <clears throat> Let's pray. God, thank you for helping us this morning and what we call this win. Thank you, God, that when we cry out to you, we walk in obedience, we walk in faithfulness. You meet us and you bless it, God. Help us to walk with trust, with strength, with confidence, and empowerment, God, by your Holy Spirit. And let's see your blessings on our lives, on our families, on our workplaces, and wherever, wherever you call us to, God. Let's walk in obedience and see the full measure of your goodness and your faithfulness meet with us. Ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great rest of your day, all. Thank you so much again for putting up with me and my voice this morning. Love you guys. God bless.